take you through why I got into family histories or why we as um, as an organization got into family histories. It's not something that we um, set out to do. Um, I come from a business um, history background. I've done corporate archiving for about 10 years before I set up Past Perfect. Um, so essentially, um, I, I approached families, uh, having worked in the corporate setup in India, you have to realize that most of the businesses are family-run businesses. I've not done, perhaps at that stage, I hadn't done a proper corporate, uh, but these were all family-run businesses. So there was a limited interaction um, with you know, with that history going from one generation to the other generation, tracing a family's history, tracing how, um, you know, how they contributed to the business and so on. Um, but it so happened, um, now we are not really uh, trained in family history, we are not genealogists um, of any kind, um, but it so happened that when we started Past Perfect and we were collaborating or we were working on various projects, um, the people who commissioned the project or, be, or people we were collaborating with um, sort of came to us asking us, you know, um, for help um, in documenting their own histories and so on. And essentially, we in Pass Perfect, um, all of us are very, very curious by nature. All right. So um, we want to know the um, sort of the evolutionary journey of, of everything. Um, if there's a subject that it sort of uh, pops up in our heads or is presented to us, we really need to understand, um, you know, how did, how did we get to this point? Um, what is the backstory? Now, it could be, it could be a political event um, or a political movement. It could be a company. It could be an institution. It could be a product. Um, we were just curious about how things evolved to what we see to the present day. Um, so essentially, um, you know, we, while our methodology is very, very um, academic and it's got to be because it's all about research, um, what we try and do in our approach um, towards storytelling is that we try and um, sort of build up the human element, the human interest story. That's what we try to do with every, um, you know, with every corporate, every institution, every family. What's the wider story? What is it? that um, you know, the community can learn from um, you know, by just reading or studying or just engaging with a particular history. So that's essentially what drew us to family histories. Um, these, was, these were very short projects and um, these were essentially conversations with family members and we liked the process. Now I start my presentation and even in the poster of this talk, I use this particular picture for me. I mean, there are tons of other you know, really striking pictures that families have. Um, but I thought this was very, very classic because each one of us has a photograph like this in our homes, right? There is somewhere in some album um, or framed um, of a classic group photo like this, which, which is grainy, which is fuzzy. Uh, you can't make out the features of everybody, but everybody's in there and it leads to conversations. Look how, you know, just look at the way you... Uh, looked back then, he was so thin, he was so fat. Um, for me, this was very, very classic. This one in particular um, is a very, very, um, you know, middle-class Maharashtran family from Bombay. Uh, they were middle-class at this point in their history. Things changed for them later on, but at this very point, they were they were middle-class, and which is why I loved, um, I loved starting off, I loved using this picture, wanted to use this picture for the poster of the talk, and I wanted to start it off um, start off this talk with this picture simply because um, what I want to want you to take away um, from this talk is that it doesn't family histories um, is not um, about leaders or overachievers. Um, every family has had an evolutionary process. Um, there are stories embedded into the life cycle of all of these families, and um, for the next generation, or even just to understand why you are wired a certain way, it becomes important to just understand how your family or how your unit uh, came to this, right? Why you have the education you have, who took these decisions, why are you not, why are you in an English medium school and not um, any other medium school? What brought you to Bombay? Um, why is it that you value some things and not others? So these are things that um, I've seen, I have understood when I, as a researcher, when I have dealt with various families, um, I've seen the patterns in their decision-making. 
um, and I've and I've very often seen um, seen the family. I mean, you know, uh, the people we are interacting with, especially my generation, also come to terms with um, these elements in their history. But you know, before we um, before we get on to um, serious matters like that, I want to. Um, essentially just take you through what we're going to do in this talk. It's going to be largely about stories because like I said, um, our, um, our approach may be academic, sorry, our uh, methodology may be academic, um, but the way we like to, uh, to do the storytelling is uh, by keeping it engaging and light. So we, we'll talk about a few micro stories from some of the families that we've worked with, um, after which um, I'll, I'll you know, take you through some of the variations that we've seen in various family histories in the projects that we've done. And of course, we'll end with, I'm guessing a lot of you over here are interested in starting the process for yourselves. Um, so we'll just quickly um, go through some of the technical um, aspects of doing a project like this, and then we'll take, we'll take questions after that. Um, anyone who's following Khaki uh, on social media would have seen the um, sort of the teaser posts uh, as a run up to this particular talk. And you would, you would remember this particular image. This is of um, Namdeo and Kusum Jangle. Um, and I am going to, um, you know, I'm going to, we worked on a book um, for the Jangles, um, which, you know, which we, I think at the beginning of the pandemic, we started the work and three or four months into um, after research is when we um, handed over uh, limited copies of the book uh, to the family. I'm going to read out um, a small chapter because I said this was a micro story. I'm not going to get into the entire history of the family, but I just want to read out a few portions from um, Namdeo Jangle's um, life. He, he's someone who um, for some reason stayed with me while we were focusing on his son as the main protagonist. For some reason, Namdeo Jangle stayed with me. Um, and, I, and I think it was, it, was this, it was the decisions that he took and it was the steps that he took that um, gave the rest of the family the platform to um, take things forward. So I'm just going to read um, a little bit from the book that we'd written. Namdeo Jangle, Suhas's father, was a self-made man who had toiled his way up from unremarkable roots to become a deputy secretary in the government of Maharashtra. As a young lad, growing up in a tiny village in Khandesh, where his parents were small-time peasants, Namdeo did not have access to quality education. His day began at the crack of dawn as he rounded up a flock of sheep belonging to the more well-to-do households in the village. For the next couple of hours, Namdeo and his flock would lumber along the rolling hillocks that were typical of this region until it was time to head back home for school. This seemingly mundane but deeply invigorating task earned him an extra one or two annas, which along with the scholarship he had received, helped pay for his school. Yes, Namdeo was no simpleton. When in primary school, Namdeo was granted a scholarship of rupees three every month in the fourth and the seventh standard. From there on, um, Namdeo uh, completes his primary education, moves on to another village uh, called um, Amalner in East Khandesh. Uh, Amalner in East Khandesh, that's right. And where he completes his high school. Um, this is where he comes under the influence of Sane Guruji as well. Now, all of these things, um, you know, the in, him coming under the influence of Sane Guruji, him uh, start, you know, beginning to uh, to follow simple living, high thinking, and all of that um, has an impact on the kind of lifestyle that he leads later, and the kind of lifestyle that his um, children are used to when they are growing up. So again, um, I, I found it important to um, sort of, you know, zero in on this particular aspect of Namdeo's life because um, you see that progression. You see that within a family, um, till about a certain point, material interest is, um, or, uh, you know, material uh, interest is not something that they are, um, you know, that they're interested in, but, ki but kind of, you know, there's an uh, upward mobility and that changes with subsequent generations and their lifestyle also changes. So we wanted to focus on these elements as well. Um, but we'll um, sort of move on to um, what happens to Namdeo when he um, sort of comes to college and he joins, um, let me just continue reading. The thirst for a college education took Namdeo to Pune, a city known for its educational institutions and reformist attitude. Here, he enrolled in Ferguson College to pursue BA honors and maths eventually ending up in the Indian Law Society to get an LLB degree. 
The 1930s was an in intriguing time to be studying law in Pune. Swaraj was no longer an elitist thought. The struggle for independence, in fact, was now a populist movement engulfing men and women from all walks of life. For Namdeo, Baba Sahib Ambedkar's visit to ILS were the most memorable. Initially, Ambedkar's monthly visits to ILS were intended to be a casual talk with students on matters of legal and national importance. But soon as word spread, uh, these visits, as word spread about these visits, the audience strength ballooned from 40 students to 200 attendees and became a nursery for revolution. However, Namdeo's life in Pune was not the easiest. More than often, Namdeo was caught in a situation or two which required him to step out of his comfort zone to penetrate a group of friends. One day, a bunch of boys from ILS had decided to rent bicycles and cycle to Sihagar, a historic fort nestled in the lap of the Sayadris. But there was a problem. Namdeo didn't know how to ride a cycle. As a child growing up in a village in Khandesh, somehow he never had the opportunity to learn the skill. The cycle trek, however, sounded too good to miss out on. And so Namdeo convinced a friend to teach him cycling. For two straight days, Namdeo practiced riding a bicycle nonstop, attempting to master the skill till late into the evening. The next day, as he and his friends attempted to maneuver through the tricky hilly terrain, Namdeo's overzealousness got the better of him. His legs were sore and his eyes felt like they would defy his brains and close any moment. And close they did. The next thing Namdeo knew was that he was lying in a ditch face down, several parts of his body throbbing under the impact. Namdeo wished he could appear for the ICS examinations. Let's go back to that little snippet that we shared on social media and let's close that, um, that aspect of Namdeo's life. Namdeo wished he could appear for the ICS examinations conducted by the British government. A government job was not only the next logical step for a law student um, with limited resources, but most of Kusum's family, Kusum being um, the woman he met in college and gets married to, um, most of Kusum's family had also secured government jobs. At the time, it was like, it felt like a promising prospect. However, going abroad to take the ICS examination was out of the question. As luck would have it, the state government um, recruited from institutions like ILS and Namdeo hurriedly put in his application. For a bright young man, the interview should have been a cakewalk. I mean, we've just heard about how he won scholarships and so on, right? Um, but there was a hiccup. The, pan the panel of interviewees who had arrived at ILS consisted of an all-white crew, and poor Namdeo struggled to understand their British accents. All he kept saying, at first confidently, and then timidly as the moments ticked by, was, I beg your pardon, I beg your pardon. He was dismissed from the room unceremoniously. Namdeo was miserable and in tears as he waited outside in the corridor, expecting what could only be bad news. A senior, who happened to be an Indian, walked past and noticed his plight. Taking pity, the official offered to plead his case to the panel, who eventually agreed to include an Indian in the panel, in the interview process, that is. Namdeo was recalled for the interview and this time, there was no doubt in anyone's mind about the potential of the candidate in front of them. Namdeo was offered a job in the government of Bombay presidency. From here, having secured his government job, Namdeo and Kusum move to, um, move to Bombay. They get a house in Kamat Colony in Dadar. Um, and, from, and he gets a job. Um, his office is Sachivale, eventually becomes Sachivale, uh, when that building is um, ready in the 1950s. Um, and, um, you know, so you, the family goes from Khandesh to Pune, settled in Bombay for the longest time. The next generation grows up in Bombay. Um, one, of, um, one of the brothers from the next generation um, um, goes on to um, IIT Madras, where um, suddenly the exposure that this particular 
um, son gets is completely different and you see uh, the family following a very, very different, or at least that unit of the family following a very, very different trajectory because of the exposure that one of the sons gets um, in, an, in an institution like IIT Madras. Another branch of the family moves abroad. So you, while you're doing that, you suddenly see that um, a story that started out in Khandesh in a small village, um, um, you know, now suddenly has um, sort of spread across and, and we, are, we, are, we were learning about West Berlin. What was it like living in Berlin at that point? Um, and, you know, several interesting uh, elements such as those. We'll now move on to um, one more, uh, another story or, or rather another family. Now, the Gupta Chans, um, I don't know even where to start about the Gupta Chans. Um, the Gupta Chans could be um, the subject of an entire talk. It could be the subject of my PhD thesis. It could be a web series on its own. Um, it's so layered and we've been able to go back uh, so far in their history um, that we realize that, um, you know, when we when we do the storytelling for the Gupta Chans, it can't be something, it can't be something that's expected. It can't be a regular coffee table book. Uh, so we've also got an ambitious with, um, with the, um, you know, with the expanse of this family's history. And um, we are hoping to uh, convert the story into, um, into a fictionalized story. Um, but let's start with what is it that we were first um, introduced to. So when we met Aditya Gupta, um, who was the one who commissioned the project, who was the one who wanted to do this, um, we started out obviously with, um, of course, I mean, not too much was known about the family. So we started out with, with his life. And um, at, from the get go, we were intrigued because here was the story of this four month old who was Aditya Gupta, our client. Um, his parents were in London. Um, his parents, his, his mother, um, they, they were studying, um, they were studying in London, uh, they'd moved abroad to study, but when they'd, um, this was a family that was based out of Hyderabad, they moved abroad, these two had moved abroad, um, and they had this child, um, but at that point, they couldn't look after the child and carry on studies, um, so they decided to pack the child off, um, the four-month-old Aditya Gupta, um, to Hyderabad, to his grandparents, and for the next nine years, Aditya Gupta spends time in Hyderabad with his grandparents, who are no ordinary people. Um, they are not people you've heard of. Um, in, in that regard, they're probably very, very ordinary. Um, but um, in terms of um, what they've done with their lives, the grandparents, um, and the kind of environment that they are able to provide Aditya Gupta, it leaves a deep impact on Aditya Gupta's life. Um, and which is why he wanted to um, sort of you know, capture this history um, because of that association that he has with his grandparents. His grandparents, after all, were like his uh, parents and he lived with them for almost nine to 10 years. Now, that's what was told to us. And we knew that we are dealing with, um, you know, a civil servant, um, his wife, who was um, you know, who was a very, very renowned um, social worker in Hyderabad, was part of the family planning um, movement in Hyderabad long before um, Indira Gandhi um, sort of changed the, um, you know, sort of the complexion of that movement. Um, and, and, you know, in general, the women's movement. But what we realized is that the more we dug deeper, we realized that both these families um, that the waves, that the trends that these families have um, have been through um, was, was humongous, was just completely awe-inspiring. So you're looking at, now, it's called the Gupta Chan family because Aditya Gupta, um, his, his father uh, is a Gupta and his mom is a uh, Chan. And we trace um, both sides of Aditya Gupta's family. Both the families, we were able to trace their history from 1857. One family is based out of Delhi. The other family um, during 18, 1857 is um, in a Rajasthan village that's close to, or in a village that's close to Rajasthan and Haryana called Chakri, uh, Charki Dadri. Um, and from there, the family, they are money lenders. Um, largely, there's a money lending history uh, in this family, but from money lenders, they, um, you know, they um, sort of move into being jewelers for the, uh, Nizam of Hyderabad, which means, um, 
you know, this side of the family, the, the Jarki Dadri family moves to Hyderabad. The Delhi side of the family moves to Hyderabad a little later, um, a couple of generations later, especially when one of them is hired as a judge in the court of the Nizam. Um, and that's why we say that the family is largely based out of Hyderabad, although their roots are from um, different um, sort of villages and cities. Um, but that's what's happening in the family, um, say in the, uh, you know, the 18th, um, 19th uh, century. But from there on, when you come into the 20th century, this money lending dweller family suddenly, um, you know, it, it changes what you're dealing with. You're, in the beginning, we were dealing with a very, very traditional Marwadi um, mindset. Um, where we had to keep in mind, uh, you know, nuances of uh, traditional setup um, like that. Uh, but suddenly, with this, with the next generation, or with the with the generation in the twentieth century, um, you have you have people who've gone to Cambridge and studied. You have people. Um, you have one. You have this generation who has joined the Hyderabad civil services. Um, this generation has already ventured. Has also ventured into business. Um, they have a very, very from, um, you know, from an academic past, they've moved to um, an industrialist, um, you know, a profession, they have, they have glass factories all over, but you come to the next generation, and then suddenly you have the corporate world coming in. The next generation is also coinciding with the 1960s and the 70s, and you have computerization. Suddenly from one family, uh, while starting one family, we are talking about it, it's beginning to look like modern India. It's beginning to look like um, what we are more familiar with because it's because we've now brought in MNCs, we've brought in computerization, we've brought in the tele, uh, color television in the early 1980s. And from there, the current generation, the Gupta generation, we're talking about um, you know investments, we're talking about venture capitalists. Um, so through just this one history, I loved how we could trace, um, you know, we could trace that whole journey that we've gone through that perhaps most of our families have gone through. We've had that very rural agrarian um, background, maybe several generations ago. Uh, for some of us, it may have been the previous generation or even uh, two generations before, but it's, it's gone from that agrarian past to, um, you know, what we, what we are seeing today. And that for me was very, very interesting. And that for me was, um, it was something that um, it was a story that had to be told and it couldn't be told in a very static coffee table kind of way. It had to be more engaging. Um, although there are several other aspects, if you just look at each generation and if we were to dissect each generation and what they did and the circumstances they were forced to respond to, that in itself becomes um, very, very interesting. And which is why I said, if you, I mean, if you could, you could just take the Gupta chance and make a web series out of it. Um, we then move on to another uh, family, the third story, and this is something I, I'm guessing some of you um, are already aware of because of um, the event that happened in January. This is um, this is the family um, that runs the Bharat Flooring uh, Tiles. Um, they're currently they've currently completed 100 years, and therefore there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of events and a lot of marketing campaigns that's happening around their uh, centenary, and you would have come across um, various aspects to this family. Now, for me, this was not a family history project, but I think it was necessary for me to talk about this project within uh, today's talk, simply because it is a business family, or rather, it was a business history project where I had to trace how in 100 years the brand has evolved. And that's when I realized that the brand has evolved because every generation of the family that has owned this company or has owned this brand has contributed its, its, um, in its own way. So while you have the founders, Feroz Shah and Rustam Sidwa, who were a certain personality, a certain type of personality, they, had, uh, they responded to circumstances um, that were presented to them. Um, and you know, because of the strength of their own personalities were able to um, take Bharat to the success that it uh, does see in the first two or three decades of its, um, of its journey um, to what happens to the brand when the subsequent generations come through was very, very interesting. Now, for instance, um, Feroz Shah, the founder and his um, nephew Rustam. Now, Feroz Shah is a You'll always hear of these two as a as a combination, if at all you do hear. You, you'll hear of a whole lot of other industrialists. You'll hear of a whole lot of other 
uh, 100-year-old brands, but somehow the conversation around Feroz Shah and, uh, and Rustam is very, very muted. So for me, um, the centenary became therefore an important time to be able to talk about the founding, uh, they're not brothers, uncle, nephew, the founding duo. But even when I looked at them, um, looked at them and we wanted to dissect them, uh, not just in terms of what they did for the company, um, but also as their personalities, I realized that Feroz Shah um, was a certain type. He was a quieter, slightly more spiritual type. He was um, perhaps even lacked in confidence, was very anxious. You, I've seen letters that he's written to his, um, to his daughters where he's talking about how worried he was when he first borrowed uh, 3,000 rupees to start the company and how, um, how if the girls... Um, if the girls are, to, you know, are in a similar situation where something is giving them anxiety, um, that they should just trust in God and their ability to come through or to see a situation through. Um, it, was, it was only when we said, when we decided that no, the centenary has to, um, has to um, you know, present Feroz Shah in the right light and we have to do justice to his image. And I decided to look into what the family had held on to or Mrs. Varyava had held on to. I'm sure some of you know Mrs. Dildamar's Varyava. Um, that's when I understood what is it that, um, you know, um, apart from just the achievements of a person, what is it that the personalities of each individual brings to the larger um, company history or any other, uh, you know, the, the wider story that you're looking at. Now, likewise, there was Muti. There was Tehmina Sidwa. Now, Tehmina Sidwa is... Um, is some she's um she's i think the second generation in terms of management but she's from the founders generation she's feroz shah's wife um but she's someone who's grown up in uh germany because her father was an academic in germany and um, i think being the only parsi family in germany uh, in berlin um their household also became that one point where where um young parsi students coming to uh, berlin would first um, sort of halt, stay there for a few days and then looked for the accommodation or settled in other parts of the city. So um, Temina was essentially born in Germany, was not aware, did not um, visit India too often, was not aware of the Indian culture. But, um, you know, one fine day um, at her doorstep comes Feroz Shah Sidwa, um, whose only agenda um, in Berlin is to go to historical sites. And Temina um, ha has said this to her daughters, and you know, it's sort of recorded um, that she was, uh, she was stunned and she was given the responsibility. She and her sister were given the responsibility of taking, the, taking Feroz Shah from one uh, historical location to the other, something like something that all tourists do. Um, and, and she noticed that this man went into every historical site and instead of looking at um, anything else, looking at the broader architecture, he only looked at the floors and came up. Um, Temina was not interested in knowing who he was up until that point, but this, this behavior of his, where he was only interested in the floor, obviously intrigued her. Um, and from there on, I think a kind of friendship developed between the two. Eventually, Temina helps Feroz Shah translate a lot of German um, technical documents that Feroz Shah was interested in. Eventually, they get married after a brief courtship. She comes to India. She comes to uh, a hardcore Parsi joint family setup, having lived in Berlin all her life, not knowing, um, not knowing the local um, language in India apart from a, apart from very very broken, um, broken, uh, broken uh, uh, Gujarati. Um, so, I mean, her, her grandson, for instance, remembers that Amina always spoke with an accent, whether she was speaking English or whether she was speaking, later in life, she learns to speak Marathi because she has to speak with the workers um, and she runs a school in Deolali. So she picks up Marathi and uh, she's speaking Marathi also with an accent. Um, but Amina, apart from that particular, you know, the charming love story that I also spoke about, um, the reason why she becomes very important within the within the history of um, Bharat flooring tiles, and for me, she's also a very very remarkable woman, is that um, you know her her husband um, suffers from a chronic lung um, infection because he's in the cement factory the whole time. Um, so the first 
So through the first few decades of her marriage, she's only spent in nursing her husband, supporting her husband. She's a fantastic typist. So while her husband is resting, she's typing out his, her, uh, you know, his correspondence, his documents and things like that. She's part of, she's very close to her husband's uh, business partner, Rustam. So all along, it is Feroz Shah, Rustam, Tehmina who are always together um, in terms of, you know, important decisions that have to be, I mean, or rather, let me say that Tehmina is part of these very business decisions or business conversations that Rustam and um, Feroz Shah are, happening, uh, are, are having. So much so that when Feroz Shah passes away and eventually when Rustam also passes away, the reigns of Bharat uh, tiles um, are transferred or taken over by Tahmina, and for the next couple of decades, still Mrs. Varyava and Firdos take over. She's the one who's um, she's the one who's taking care of the business. Um, so um, these were my three stories um, that I really wanted to talk about. Um, I'm hoping that by talking about a few micro um, stories, a few uh, anecdotes from each of these um, each of these families, I've I've been able to tell you, or I've been able to demonstrate why. Um, you know, di deep diving, for me at least, deep diving into each of these families is a deeply satisfying process. Um, it's not just that I understand a lot more about, uh, about the journeys that the family has taken, but I'm also constantly, um, I'm, 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 drawing, I'm drawing parallels, I'm understanding the larger, um, the, the larger evolution. So for instance, it's always there always has to be this one generation that is, um, like I was saying, English educated from where on you see the family starting to behave in a, in a different way. Um, there's, always, there's always that point where wealth accumulation happens in the family. Um, so up until that point, uh, the family is behaving in a certain way, the lifestyle, the uh, rituals that they follow, their mannerisms, the clothes they wear, uh, they, they wear the, um, the food they eat is a certain type. But then once, once there is wealth accumulation in a particular generation, from there on, you see things evolving. So I like drawing these parallels and I just wanted to uh, talk about three specific families. Um, but like I was saying, it doesn't necessarily have to be about uh, overachievers or leaders or heroes. Um, any family, you could take any Indian family or ordinary family and and yet find the most remarkable stories in the history of these families. Um, however, there may be, um, you know, there may be a, they may vary in why, uh, in the purpose behind um, why it's being done. So for instance, um, we've come across various um, uh, projects or rather we've taken up various projects where the purpose has not been to document the history, but the purpose has essentially been to um, sort of safeguard, to preserve what has uh, what has remained, to preserve what has uh, been handed over to the current generation, and that's also a great part. That's also a perfectly um, logical part to start your family history program if if you're interested in. So, for instance, if I may talk about one of our earliest family history projects. Um, now we'd come across. We were introduced to this uh, this lady called. Um, uh, Mrs. Chanda Varkar. Now she had material, she had documents and letters um, that belonged to her father-in-law um, and his family, um, which she which were handed over to her. Um, and she was unsure of what to do with them. She knew um, these documents were um, the, she knew these documents were important because her father-in-law was um, her father-in-law and his father were involved, um, played a role in the educational policy in, in Bombay state, Maharashtra state, and so on. Also, um, a, you know, a particular ancestor was also uh, involved in the, um, in, in the princely state of Indore. He was a prime minister of the Maharaja of Indore. So she did know that there was some relevance to these documents, um, but she didn't know what to do with them and who would be interested. And at the same time, she wanted to know whether there was anything within these documents that was of that could be of interest only to the family, could be confidential, and therefore, um, uh, you know, not she didn't want those, she didn't want that material to be um, sent to any repository and things like that. So we um, started out with uh, just looking at the family's papers, the diaries, the correspondence, everything that had been preserved. 
And then in order to, in order to just simply understand what is confidential, what is not confidential, what can be of historical importance if we are to send this, send the collection to say a National Archives of India or to the Asiatic Society Library, because she was very clear that she didn't want to hold on to these, that this material had to be, um, you know, had to sit with a larger institute that would have, uh, you know, that would give it, um, you know, a larger research appeal. Um, so we had to anyway dig deeper into the family's history just to understand um, just to read between the lines, just to put the whole collection within its context. Um, so sometimes the family history project just begins from there. You've been handed over stuff or you've been, uh, you've discovered stuff and you just have to, and you don't know what to do with it. And we start our process, we start our process from that point itself. Um, family histories, you should also keep in mind that family histories vary in scale. We ourselves um, do different kind of family history projects, okay? Um, the Bajaj archive, for instance, is a full-fledged, it's a family archive, which means we're not getting into the detailed history of, say, um, you know, the Bajaj scooter or uh, the corporate history of Bajaj auto or Bajaj electrical. We are looking at the family's history. That family, yes, has, um, again, has a slightly more uh, public history because they've been involved with the freedom struggle um, for generations. I mean, uh, you know, right from Jannalal Bajaj and so on. Um, and so, and therefore we do understand the research value of, um, of a family like that or the of, uh, of a family like that. And therefore the archive that gets set up or the, or the scale of that family history project is very institutional like. It's not, it's not something that you can get done in two or three months where you uh, sort material out, uh, capture, document the history, uh, hand it over to the family and move on. It's a proper archive that, you, that our team is uh, uh, are currently managing. We're constantly getting leads that we are pursuing. It's a full on uh, day job at the Bajaj archive, although it's a family archive. On the other hand, just like I had uh, shared the example of the Chanda Varkar's project, there are several other family history projects where we are given a bedroom and we are sitting on the either the uh, either the bed like my colleague over here is sitting and just going through material. There've, there've also been families who've come and said to me that I have a massive 12 seater dining table and you can sit there for two months and do whatever you want to do. That dining table is yours. Um, all I'm trying to say here is that it doesn't matter um, what the budget is, it doesn't matter what the material is, um, you know, an archiving or a documentation project can be tailor-made um, as long as there is that interest, there is that, um, you know, there is that vision to take on this, um, this journey. Um, something else that you need to keep in mind is that you know, when you are getting into family histories, it doesn't necessarily um, have to be about um, someone, you know, being a Rai Bahadur or someone getting a Padma Bhushan in your family. Um, there are other ways to um, anchor a family history. Um, sometimes, and very often we've seen this, and this is one of the projects that we are doing currently, um, the family history is anchored around the house, around the ancestral home. It's not, it's not an achievement. It's not that Gandhi came home, um, you know. So, for instance, in my own family, for the longest time, I've heard that um, Gandhi had come to our house, and there was there was nothing else that we'd heard of. And that that one episode gets told to everybody. Um, but there are that I've realized now that there are other reasons why, because I've, we've worked with so many families, that there are other reasons which move families to take this on. And like I said, in this case, it becomes the home. It uh, becomes an ancestral home uh, that has been handed over to them. Now, this, for instance, is Bellevue um, in Khandala. Now, this was a property. This was the land. This was an estate that was once owned, owned by the Gigi boys. Um, then it moved on to another Parsi family, the Khare Khats, And today it's with um, another Parsi family. And through this home, although it is essentially, um, I mean, we have to be careful over here. This could have easily become uh, the history of land ownership 
or this could have easily become uh, an architectural history where we trace, um, you know, at which point, which room was built and what is the design history of a particular room? What are the features that um, you're looking at? But because we work in a certain way and past perfect, like I was saying, and we're already always interested in the human element or the human interest story. Um, for us, the home, the ancestral home only becomes the theater where the family is living out its life. So we are keen on understanding how every generation of this family has used that home. What are the memories within this home? How has the spatial history within the family changed? So for instance, what is the veranda used for? What happened in the rainy season in Kandala when um, the veranda was out of bounds? Um, what did the family, what did the kids do then? At which point would um, the kids, the kids who were growing up uh, either in, um, in boarding school or in Bombay, um, when did they go to Khandala? Why is it that Khandala, this Bellevue home is so important to them? Um, they've spent their vacations over there. What did they do in vacations? In Bombay, the only social life that the kids knew was, um, you know, was the club life. But in Khandala, in Bellevue, they're climbing trees, they're chasing monkeys, they're getting lost in the woods. Uh, there are search parties that are sent because the kids have not come back for dinner. So it's all of these things that you fold into, um, they fold into the story of something as inanimate as a home. And, and I mean, that's, that's just something that we always do and say the, um, you know, the larger story of the family. Um, now, there have been times where I've told you this, uh, the story of Aditya Gupta and why he wanted to do, why he wants to write his own family's history. Um, and that's not an isolated case. Um, family after family, and these are these are uh, people. The, my clients are typically uh, people from my generation, as old as I am, late thirties, early forties, who have uh, who have who have had uh, you know a remarkable relationship with their grandparents, um, and they want to do this because of that relationship that they shared with their grandparents. Um, so the you know a grandchild's curiosity or the or the affection or the um, the love and the warmth that uh, the grandchild has felt in the presence of the grandparents or the great grandparents becomes an important element um, because becomes an important deciding factor um, especially in these families when they're taking on this project. Let me just give you this one example. Um, for instance, this is something. Um, I mean, there was an article that came out last month on this. Uh, we had the, we were working on some other project and we had the good fortune of assisting um, Vikram Aditya Motwane in, uh, you know, sort of digging into his family's history. Um, but, the, but essentially, what is it that moved him to um, Vikram Aditya Motwane, the uh, filmmaker? Um, what moved him to get into, uh, or rather what moved him to start this journey was simply because when he started his film career, um, he was handed over a DVD, um, a CD or a DVD of a film that um, one of his ancestors had produced. That film was called Andolan. It was released in 1951. Um, and, um, you know, because Vikram Aditya was at that point just uh, getting into the film industry, one of his uncles thought it was ironic and therefore handed, handed uh, the CD over to him. And up until that point, I don't think uh, it was within the families, or certainly not within um, um, sort of Victor Aditya's consciousness that, that his family had a filmmaking history. He knew that his family um, were uh, Sindhis who had moved from um, Karachi, Larkana in Pakistan, set up business in Bombay. Uh, they owned the Chicago radio brand uh, and um, other elect um, you know, engineering um, interests they had. Uh, but this element was something that um, perhaps would have told to him, but it hadn't sort of stayed with him. And that's where the curiosity grew. Um, and while we were working on another project with him, um, sort of he requested us to see what else we could get um, on this particular film. We, of course, found a whole lot of stuff. We found articles on uh, the Murad shot. We found this one um, advertisement. We found a review of the, um, of the film. We also, of, of course, dug deeper because it's us. We went into the family's history. We went into the family's business history, why it shut down, who did what, and looked into various things. The larger point of this, um, this particular slide is that um, it is something that I'm noticing that very often it is, um, it is the grandchild um, or the grandchildren um, who want to take on this journey. 
simply because there has been that positive, um, simply because the grandparents have had a positive influence or the family has had a po positive influence in their lives. And, um, and they want to now take this journey of documenting their own family histories in a more structured way and not have this fragmented, just so that when this has to be passed on, um, there's something comprehensive, something consolidated that can be passed on. Um, but what is it that we go through? And maybe some of you have uh, started this process for yourselves uh, and you've come across uh, a few, uh, you know, you've been stonewalled or you've come across a few hurdles. It's something that we come across all the time. I'm just going to talk about two or three of them and maybe we can take the others uh, in the question answer round. Um, there's always, um, there's always a gap. You've got a lead, you want to pursue it, but then you suddenly get stonewalled. You don't, um, you know, you, you are unable to resolve that particular lead or come to a conclusion or close that loop. That happens. Um, what is far more frightening is that when you decide to, um, during the process of research, when you decide to um, ignore certain, um, certain personalities or certain histories. Um, or even if you don't want to, this has already happened. So for instance, this one particular um, you know, image, uh, this is from my own family. Uh, from my own family, when I say that, I mean this is from the Chatterjee family. Um, and it, was, it shook me because the portrait of this woman um, hangs in the ancestral home. Um, and I was visiting the ancestral home for the first time. Um, and I was obviously asking all kinds of questions. And I saw the portrait of this woman. And I asked, um, you know, who is she? Unfortunately, nobody remembered who she was. They knew she was the great grandmother, but they didn't know what her name was. They couldn't remember what her name was. They knew it at some point, but um, it was not something that they held on to. This is something that happens very often and it happens with the women in the family. Be very careful about that. How you, how you um, project the women in the family is very, very important. It gets my goat when each time I ask about um, the woman of a family, uh, if I ask um, someone in an interview, what do you remember about your mother, about your grandmother? If the answer is, I loved the dal she made, I remember she made lovely dal, or she was a great support to my grandfather or my father, it's annoying. Surely, and being a working mother, I know that uh, even if it's a housewife, there is a there's a much deeper role the woman is playing. So you have to you have to figure out a way to uh, bring that element out. You have to figure out a way of probing further. Um, you know, um, thinking out of the box, giving your interviewee various situations, asking them how would your mother react if something like this would have happened. Um, do you remember uh, what she did when you were ill? You have to constantly, so you have to constantly keep, um, you know, uh, think on your um, feet, especially when you're doing interviews and when someone can't remember, but of course not in a, um, not in, in, a, um, in a way that you are interrogating them, but just help them remember, just help them realize that these are also elements in your history, in your family's history that need to be recorded. Um, I just took this one, um, one example to talk about um, the, you know, um, the wider need to talk about the women in, um, women in the family, but this also applies to, um, um, apply, applies to people who didn't do much. That's a tricky area as well. Um, you may have had, uh, you know, several success stories in your family, but spend some time on those people who've not uh, not been the conventional success stories. There, you know, there are layers that can come out in the family history, even by talking about these people. Um, the other aspect which, which happens very often is, um, for instance, uncomfortable histories. Um, take, for instance, again, the Gupta Chand family. Now, within the Gupta Chand uh, history, especially the Chand side of the family, uh, one of the family members, that's Amir Chand, um, the, one of the family members, sorry, that's Amir Chand, um, was involved in the bombing, um, you know, uh, bombing of the Viceroy in Delhi in 1911 or 12. I'm sorry, I'm a little confused about dates. I usually am. Uh, just because I'm a historian, that doesn't mean I know my dates pat. 
Um, but this happens around the ni- around 1911 or 1912. I know he, uh, I know the case happens in 1913. So obviously the bombing happens a little before that. Now Amir Chand, uh, Amir Chand is um, accused um, in this case. He is um, he's one of the he's one he's he he's he belongs to the party that threw the bomb. Um, and at this point in Amir Chand's life, he has. Um, he has an he has an adopted son who's living with him, and he has a nephew also who's living with him. The nephew eventually becomes um, Aditya Gupta's grandfather. All right. Um, so what is very intriguing is that when we looked at the grandfather's papers, and the grandfather eventually, I think about 1915-16, goes to Cambridge. Soon after this particular hanging of Amir Chand happens, he goes to Cambridge. But nowhere in the grandfather's papers or anywhere is any reference um, to Amir Chand. All right, even in the consciousness of the family at this point, there is no reference, no official documentation um, acknowledges Amir Chand as um, a relative. But today, if you talk to the family, they are very, very proud about uh, proud of Amir Chand. They understand today in 2020, 21, 22 that. What Amir Chand did back then uh, was revolutionary and he needs to be uh, celebrated in the family. But soon after this event, when you have a young boy from the family going to Cambridge on a government scholarship um, to study in England, it was not, it was not a comfortable um, thing to discuss. It was not a comfortable thing to acknowledge. These things will happen in every family. Um, as it becomes easier as professionals to go into the family um, and show them, demonstrate to them why, um, or help them come to terms with it. It's, it can be therapeutic. It can be, um, you know, it, it can be a completely uh, different process. It can be a very, very surreal process. Uh, but it's very important when you're doing this that you learn to acknowledge these uncomfortable histories within your family, if there is a second or a third wife, if there is an illegitimate child, if there is, um, if there's casteism in your family, all of these things need to be addressed. There's no need to whitewash them. Um, there is a way you can present them, but at this point when you are documenting your history, um, you mustn't whitewash them or you mustn't um, skip them um, from research at least. You can take a call as to when you are, if it's going to become a book or it's going to become something else, what you focus on, but get into that documentation, get into an analysis of why this happened, how this happened, and what what did it lead to? Um, these are important conversations you need to have when you are uh, doing family histories. There's another, I mean, I met this other, we met this other gentleman um, who I've not spoken about, but uh, this gentleman called George Matthews. Um, a more modern story, George Matthews, we're looking at um, the 1940s to present day. George Matthews is, a, is um, sort of based out of Pune, um, has a corporate, um, it, it's, it's more of a corporate story, a proper serviceman, um, becomes, um, becomes an entrepreneur 20 years into, 20 years after he is, um, he's done service, I think 20 years. Um, in the beginning, um, his business is flourishing. He's one of the only vendors that is providing LACME with, uh, LACME if I'm not wrong, is providing LACME with uh, containers, plastic containers and so on, right? His, his unit in Pune is making these containers. We've, we've understood through conversations with him that talcum powder had to always be in a tin container and never plastic container. That is why da, 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 all of these conversations that have been very, very enriching for us, we've had these. But what was, uh, what was remarkable about our conversation with George Matthews was that, um, you know, after the initial years of success, he, he gets covered in Business India. Uh, there's an article written on him. He's reached, I mean, he's arrived. And then there's this one point in the, in the oral history interview, suddenly he'll go like, um, you know, with a very straight face, he'll go like, and then began my downfall. And he took us through it. He took us through what happens to his business thereafter, where he made a mistake, all those decisions that were incorrect, everywhere that um, every time he turned to someone for help and he didn't get that help. And, the, and he's obviously rationalizing all of it while he's talking to us. 
and he's 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 understanding i mean i'm sure he's come to terms with it even before that but he is very nonchalantly telling us through the conversation that i understand why they didn't help me out but uh, this is what happened i knew i had it was my own battle i knew i had to um, come out of it i had to survive on my own um now he could have chosen not to say that his family could have said that no but we don't want to talk about uh, the negative parts we don't want to talk about the downfall why don't you talk about the fact that um after losing everything he again um uh, you know set up um his own consultancy um but that was not what uh, george matthews wanted us to do george matthews wanted us to spend time with him uh, going through that process going through that phase in life it's um it helps uh, like i'm saying the moment you start a family history project and if you're true to the process if you are genuine to the process um it it becomes a therapeutic process it becomes uh, um it it becomes a learning uh, process for the family as well as you uh, it doesn't matter what the output is just follow go with the flow go with what is uh, what is coming out there's always a time to take editorial calls but during research one needs to just go with the flow and understand and make sense of everything that's happening um this is going to happen all the time in in indian families uh, there's prejudice one chachi will not like someone else and they, and she will say uh, mean things about um, about uh, somebody else another brother will um, will not give um, you know his brother credit for uh, for the success that the family business went through all of this is going to happen um you need to hear it out uh, as the researcher as the one who's documenting um a you can't dismiss your subject's uh, perspective you need to hear it out um at, and then and then be able to say the say the whole story in a very very non partisan way but the point is that you need you need to keep room for contrarian perspectives um uh, even if even if um in our case it happens all the time even if our client tells us that there's no point talking to so and so person uh what will he say or what will she say we always insist that let's just talk to him we can at least get a few memories that's 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 how we sort of get our toe hold into that conversation we'll at least get a few memories from him some anecdotes um and once we are in the process once we are already engaging with the person and talking to the person and doing our oral history interviews then the conversation can uh, you know you can you can um investigate why a certain prejudice exists you can investigate why a certain um, why somebody um remembers an event differently from what everybody else has told you why why memory is subjective and um why you um you know why you don't look into or you don't um take the facts of memory too seriously what you need to look into is why does someone remember it in a certain way or why does someone remember it at all those are the things that you need to um, sort of uh, dig deeper into i'm going to quickly close uh, the presentation with a few quick tips um typically these are the processes we follow just in case anybody is interested we start with the basic we start with a family tree um especially as outsiders coming into um, you know this um, this uh, scenario we have to start with the family tree so that we know what the names are who who is related to whom how um we also start with a on any project actually we start with the timeline of events um that's a great place to start you then move on to oral history interviews with uh, people um these oral history interviews remember always try and keep it as life story ish as possible so which means if you go if you are talking to an aunt um and you are curious to know about uh, the family's village life don't just stick to that aspect of the conversation that aunt has given you her time uh, talk about her life um you know investigate her life in various ways um there will be certain elements of the family's influence that are bound to uh, or insights that are bound to come out through that conversation so um stick to the life story of each of your interviewee as a as as the historian as the researcher as the um as the one who's taken and taking an editorial call you can decide which element is important for the family's history and which is a very very personal 
um, history for, uh, you know, for, important for that person you've interviewed. Um, try and get as many memories as possible. Try and get as many anecdotes as possible. Uh, and like I said, um, perspectives, um, sort of however problematic, is always good to have. Um, you then move on to the material research. At least in our case, we find that very, uh, we find it very simple. After we've spoken to a few people, after we've done interactions, uh, if we look at photographs and personal belongings and documents um, after an interaction like that, because then we are able to link what we've heard with what we are seeing. Otherwise, it's just one photograph after the other, after the other one face after the other, one group photograph after the other, and it, it doesn't make sense to us. So look into go into documents and photographs and albums and things like that after you've um, after you've interacted with various family members. Um, I would, I mean, now this is something I would just advise on any history project um, from time to time, um, you know, just take a step back uh, and go through what you've collected so far. Um, you know, uh, it, it, it is extremely helpful just so that, um, just so that you have a sense of what you've collected, where the gap is. Um, so you've, you've got to take stock from time to time, perhaps take a new person, take a new audience member and say the story to someone new, right? And the moment you do that, you will realize that, okay, there are gaps. I didn't know how this connection happened. Maybe I should go back and ask my grandparents about it, or maybe I should go back and see the letters and see whether there's something missing there. So keep taking stock, keep telling the story to different sets of people, just so that, uh, you know, uh, you're more objective. Um, couple of things that you need to keep in mind. Um, like I, I, I hope I have demonstrated that, but go beyond achievements, go beyond uh, bio data successes. Uh, that's not where the story is. The story is um, is what enabled um, you know these achievers or what enabled this particular milestone event, and what did that lead to? How does that milestone event in someone's life change? that person's life or the next generation's life. That's what you need to go, go into. Otherwise, it's just a bio data and that's, not, um, that's no fun. Uh, no one's going to remember that. Uh, that, can, that can be a scrapbook, uh, but you're not really using your family's history for anything, uh, uh, you know, for a more fulfilling uh, process, uh, for a more fulfilling purpose, that is. Um, Spread wide, interact with as many people uh, from different generations, uh, cousins, aunts, uncles, uh, relatives, neighbors, friends, um, involve everybody. It takes time. Uh, there's going to be a lot of back and forth. A lot of people will not remember things, but at least talk to them. Um, there are various uh, perspectives, various aspects that you may get. For instance, uh, the Namdeo Jangli episode that I talked to you about uh, was not told to us by his son. Um, his grandchildren remembered, all right? Uh, and if we had uh, decided to only focus on the son thinking that the grandchildren are, you know, what would they know and things like that, we wouldn't have got all of those things. But obviously in his lifetime, uh, Namdeo Jangli did not, and this happens very often in all our families, you don't talk too much with your children. But by the time you retire and you have grandchildren, you are um, you're chatting with them a lot more and the grandchildren are have more of a right to your time than your children did. Um, and so therefore it makes sense. So you never know um, where a particular story will come out from. Going back to the Gupta Chand story, um, the love story between uh, Aditya Gupta's parents, obviously nobody in the family knew, right? Uh, because you didn't talk about your, uh, your sort of love story with, with your family members. So we had to get in touch with um, Prem Prakash Gupta's friends from school and college. They told us what uh, Prem Prakash Gupta as a you know, 15 year old, 16 year old was like. They told us what Shanta Gupta was like, what they were like when they were in love. Um, you know, today Aditya Gupta remembers his parents very differently, but these guys were able to tell us what these two 16, 17 year old kids were like when they just met each other, when they were in love, what happened when, um, you know, one of them had to go uh, to study in ISC Bangalore and so on. So you never know whom you may get little nuggets of information. And these, these bits of information help in building um, the personalities um, that you have in mind. 
And like I've already said before, be cautious of prejudice, hear it out. Um, but you know, um, you'll, you'll have to have a fair understanding of what is important, what is not, where, uh, where is it a colored opinion and what you need to take out from that. Um, in case, of course, I do know this is something a lot of families are doing, a lot of individuals are doing, um, that is getting into digital archiving. Some quick tips um, in terms of digital archiving. When you digitize, please rename the files. Do not leave files, um, you know, um, as the auto-generated file name, img underscore da da da, that's not going to help anybody. That's certainly not going to help your nephew or son or daughter whom you're going to hand over this to. They're just going to get um, completely befuddled by what you hand over to them. So rename files, um, rename files to identify who's there, what's the function, what's the occasion. If you can put a decade down in the file name, always helps. Categorize the material in whichever way you want to. You can categorize it generation-wise, personality-wise, location-wise, event-wise, Whatever works for you, there is no hard and fast rule. Whatever works for you, categorize. Do not have a massive folder with 500 photographs. That's not helping anybody out. Um, get into metadata, get into file naming, get into organizing your material. Um, last but not the least, a little difficult to do this unless you are um, a trained researcher, um, but give it a shot. Uh, interpret the material. Keep going back uh, with every interview that you take, or with every um, you know, with every couple of interviews that you take. Go back to your material. Go back to your photographs. Go back to your letters. Reread them. Uh, see them again. You will each time look at the material in a different way. It happens as as the layers of understanding um, sort of uh, pile um, on you know on top of each other. You will start looking at your own material differently and you will the story the story the story story start learn to also interconnect material what letter do you have um if a letter is written in a particular location do you have pictures of that particular location again if there is an output in mind then all of this um sort of helps that interconnection that interpretation always helps it 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 sort of lends to a slightly more layered story um, from all of this, um, you know, uh, you know, let me just close with um, some things that you that I would like to um, like you to keep in mind is that if you're interested, you need to do it now. Don't wait around. Obviously, um, people are not going to be around for a long time, but so is your interest. Um, um, and that is going to wane. So do it now if you're interested. It doesn't take too long. You can give like two, three months of your time. Uh, in doing it and pursuing it and close it. And then if you come back to revisit it later, it's fine. But if it struck you, you must take it on um, right now. Um, while you're doing research, um, don't worry about what happens to all of this. Don't worry about, oh, am I making, uh, can this become a film? Can I, who will write this book? How do I convert this? Do I make a Facebook page out of it for the family? Um, don't worry about all of that. At the time of research, just keep gathering data. Once you're sitting with enough information, stories, material, that's when it can get converted. That's when it'll automatically let the content speak to you. It'll automatically come to you as to what is it that you need to do. Are you looking at a quick presentation that can be um, sent across on WhatsApp? Or are you looking, um, are you looking at a social media page, an Instagram page where um, you're just telling the various, you know, the layered story of your own family. Um, the format can be, and if you have the budget, fine, go ahead, make a film, write a coffee table book. All of that's always possible. Uh, but that's something that you get into much later. Um, in case you need help, we're always there, but that's the very end of my um, presentation. I, and we can take questions if there are any. Thank you, Thank you. That was a lot, really wonderful. And you went into great detail on how we can do all this for our own families. And um, also, you know, some of the families that you spoke about and you, there are lots and lots of uh, messages of saying how it, the session was very interesting. Um, there is, there are a couple of questions. I'm just going to pull them up. Um, 
Srikanth had asked, what is your methodology? But I think in the interest of time now, I think we've answered that, do you think? Um, okay. Srikanth, if there's anything else you want to know, please like get in touch with us or we can give you uh, Sangamitra's strategy. Is there anything else you want to add in just in case of, okay, he says it's fine. He, I think we've done that. Um, uh, Radhika had a couple of questions. She said, do you, does there always have to be physical material or can you just start with stories? Um, so yes, you can always start with stories. In fact, in the case of Aditya Gupta, the physical material, the Gupta Chan family, the physical material came to us very late. We started out with stories. Uh, I do understand that people have, um, be, you know, you've moved homes, your, your ancestral home is somewhere else, the home that you've grown up is somewhere else, you've settled somewhere else, so you don't have access to the material. So we always start with stories. Okay, and she also had heard a story about Master Tara Chand who had thrown a bomb, and she didn't so, didn't know where that story came from. <laughs> no, so the Amir Chan was the one who threw the bomb, or was part of the group that threw the bomb. Uh, Master Tara Chand is part of the family, um, but um, again, I, I like I told you that family has so many layers and so many branches. Tara Chand loses his parents, um, um, Tara Chand and four other brothers and sisters lose their parents during the mutiny. Um, they take refuge in, uh, in one of the churches in uh, Delhi. And we do know that he, he converts to Christianity and moves to Calcutta. So the family also has this Calcutta history, which I couldn't get into here, but we've, we've investigated that as well. Okay. Um, there are two questions from Nick Hill. One is that, you know, for everyone is not a Bajaj or a Sidwa, but they're just like regular families. Uh, and his is a Punjabi Khatri immigrants from, from Jung in West Punjab. With, they also have no ancestral home so or any possibility of accessing it. So how would you go about researching a family history then? See, like I said, and which is why I specifically spoke about the Junglis. Right. Mm -hmm. And George Matthew, they're very, very ordinary families, families just like us. Um, but the moment you start, look, at the end of the day, it's all um, it's all about how human beings have responded to situations that came up in their lives. Right. It could be um, and there's always it doesn't need to be a rags to riches story. It doesn't need to be the story of uh, surmounting challenges. It can be even in very, in, even in its ordinariness, there's so much that you can learn from people. And mm -hmm. that's what you need. And, you know, that's what you need to, um, you know, identify when you're doing family histories. Um, and if, no, if, if nothing at all, if nothing like that exists, and some of us um, you know, some of our families may be extremely uninteresting and we things have just fallen into our lap and we've just done one thing after the other. That's also fair. But um, that may have some kind of, a, that may have had some kind of an impact on your own life. I'd probably get into that. I'd probably get into, um, you know, understanding that today, whatever you are, are um, you know, you are, um, your situation, um, you know, um, the things that you are enjoying, the luxuries that you are enjoying or, um, you know, your life. How does that, uh, um, how, I mean, how have you got here? How has anything that your, your parents or grandparents done affected that? So that's probably what I do at start off with, because I don't believe, um, I don't believe um, that, that there is, that no family has anything to say. And you dig deeper, you keep asking questions, and you're always, you're bound to find something that, um, that will strike a chord. But it's more conversations. If nothing exists, just have conversations, um, pose various uh, scenarios to relatives, um, ask them, if not anything else, ask them about global events or national events and ask them, what did, did it not affect you? Something or the other will, uh, will come up. And remember something, people love talking about themselves. You give them the opportunity to, uh, and you you'd ask them to dissect their lives. Not everybody gets the chance to write an autobiography or get interviewed by uh, the media. You sit and do that. They they love to talk about themselves, and you'll get your stories over there. 
That's a good point, I think. Uh, he also had another question about how much is genetics and DNA testing being used for family history study in India? Um, not yet, not yet so much. Um, and, and simply because, see, a lot of the family history, what you need to keep in mind is, is, is not so much to understand, um, you know, how, um, how far and wide the family has spread or who are the members of the family. Are, are, we, are we connected to um, someone else? But it's more nostalgic. The process from what I have seen is largely um, is a deeply sentimental uh, uh, process. It's happening because there are memories. It's they, I mean, it's obvious that these are very very um, you know these are families that have had a positive impact on on my clients, and mm -hmm. therefore they are doing this. Um, very rarely do dysfunctional families want to do their family histories. <laughs> All right, so um, it's all about what you remember, why you, why you, um, I mean, I don't want to sound like Karan Johar, but why you love your family, it comes from that space as of now. So there is, as of now, no scope for DNA and genetics, um, because that's not something that has impacted your, impacted your life. If mm. you don't know if somebody is connected to you, um, then why would you, I mean, th that's where the headspace is right now. Let me just put it that way. But it's great for science. If somebody yeah. takes this up, uh, one never knows what it will open up. Yeah. Uh, we have another question from Aditya. In two of your micro stories, the city of West Berlin pops up, which is quite surprising. Uh, I would have expected British cities like London or Manchester to come up since there's a, you know, more direct link uh, but why would a german city be so popular amongst indian families and was it a coincidence or is that like a thing um well in the case of um, the sidva variavas it was still berlin uh, at that point it was not west berlin um in i remember when we were doing the junglies uh, and when we so it was very interesting as to why this brother decided to go to berlin for instance Right. Um, like I was saying, this brother was not um, one of the brothers was an IIT Madras graduate. Um, this one in particular was not inclined towards um, higher education, but somehow and I don't remember the story exactly now. Um, I know my colleague is um, on this call and perhaps she remembers it. But this one, this particular brother just happens to get an opportunity to um, to go to West Berlin and do a job over there, um, assist in a shop or some such thing. Oh, I do know that eventually he sets up a, a sort of a grocery store in West Berlin. Um, but yeah, exactly. Why why does that happen? The other brother went, went somewhere else, went abroad to study. Uh, this one wanted to go abroad, but um, somehow couldn't manage and therefore, you know, applied for the IIT entrance. The middle brother um, was quite, was not interested to uh, interested in higher education, found, got this opportunity and packed his bags and left. There's, there's nothing strategic about it. It's all very organic. And, and that's the reason why, um, you know, I put out that thing that the, that, you know, some of these journeys that the families have taken are also very interesting. Berlin is, is coincidentally, I picked out two stories from Berlin uh, or, or two families that had some kind of a Berlin connection. But then there's other connection as well. So the junglies, for instance, you have a Mirzapur connection, right? Um, now, uh, Suhas Jangle, who graduates from IIT Madras, um, now the family today settled in Pune. They set up their business for the last 20 years in Pune. But while he was with Gam in India, after, after finishing his studies in IIT Madras, he was posted posted in Mirzapur. He was posted um, in another posting. He was in Madhya Pradesh. Mm -hmm. So again, all of these things happen. So it's lovely for me when you feel that this is going to be the trajectory and then you suddenly realize that no, there's been another influence in this man's life. Um, and, you, and you just get curious about it. You keep asking, what did you see? What did that teach you? How did you live there? And things like that. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah. So Berlin just happened to be both your stories. Okay. Um, there was another question and I'm not very clear about it. As a researcher, how do you segregate or classify the family history? Um, 
Yeah. Seg- uh, but why are you segregating it? Yeah, I'm sorry. I've lost who has, I didn't write down who asked that question. If the person wants to unmute, please go ahead and ask. Uh, I think it was Isa. Yeah. Oh. Isa, do you want to ask the question? Okay, we'll get back to that then. Um, Lisa will ask me this separately as well. Yeah. Okay, we'll come back to that. One. So Lisa, I don't know what your question was, but we are segregating and categorizing material. Um, the, fa- I mean, the family's history is more like an evolution, like I said. So I'm not segregating. Uh, I'm in fact looking for patterns. I'm looking for interconnections uh, from one between one generation and another. So I'm not really segregating. Okay, um, uh, then uh, the Akirti is asked that uh, she's been researching her family history for a few years and one branch is Anglo-Indian and there's a lot of documentation available online, but it's harder from the other branches. Would love to know some ways or archives that you know about uh, finding documentation of beyond what's available with the family. There are um, there are ways now. It's it's a lot simpler if uh, somebody in the family has been a public figure, or somebody in the family has um, um, you know has had some engagement with a colonial institution. Mm. All right, that could be a company that could be um, that could be the government that could be an, um, any a university uh, because you know you know there are ways to dip into their archive and get material. So the moment that kind of engagement has happened in some generation, you get material. It's it's fairly easy to get yeah. material. Yes, but yeah. if that's not happened, um, then it becomes difficult and you have to entirely base it on um, oral history interviews. What has mm. helped also, again, let's keep in mind that, um, let me go back to um, the Gupta Chand family. Um, because we're looking at generations from 1857 onwards, and we're looking at about close to five or six generations, if I'm not wrong, some generations are very well documented. That So Aditya Gupta's father, who was part of the Department of Electronics, <clears throat> sorry, who brought the color television into India, his life's fairly well documented. Sorry, at least that part of his life is fairly well documented. Right, So we do know what he does um, when he comes back to India. But now his money lender great grandfather, there's there's nothing there's nothing available uh, on that. Uh, the family is based in Hyderabad. Maybe the Hyderabad State Archives has something, um, but I know most of the records are going to be in Urdu. I've not been able to uh, crack that as yet. Um, mm-hmm. So you you have to build that story from a secondary sources. If there have been other scholars, other books, other families. Um, and and go the academic route in that case. If someone has already commented, um, written about another era, you know, another community, another locality, go read all of that and then try and juxtapose um, that wider history to how, um, some of it is going to be a leap of faith. You have at this point, for instance, in Charki Dadri, we did realize that Charki Dadri was also, we did not know in the beginning that Charki Dadri was affected by 1857, right? Charki Dadri is in Haryana, 1857 uh, is happening in Chandni Chok. One Mm. family, one side of the family we know is directly affected by um, 1857. We know the the, uh, except for the five siblings or the four siblings, the rest of the family is wiped out. We know they become orphans. That's part of folklore. That's part of family legend. But now if you're starting the story of this family in 1857, you have to also place what the other family is doing in 1857, right? You can't start the story of that family in 1880. It doesn't make sense. Then you have to go back and see um, how could, for instance, 1857 have affected. Now, at the end of the day, Haryana, Charki Dadri is not too far away from Delhi. What was the impact? Um, So you do a little bit of research and we found something about um, you know, about the uh, the Raja or the nobleman or the, uh, you know, the Nawab of Charki Dadri or some such person who was, um, I think, on the side of, uh, there was some role he had played. And therefore, there was a fear 
for uh, a brief while that Charki Dadri too could get attacked. Okay. All right, we came, that came that came to us because someone else, some other scholar, some other researcher, some other PhD thesis somewhere had covered that for us. Hmm. Uh, and eighteen fifty seven is a very well documented event. So we were able to then, you know, um, sort of take that leap of faith. Imagine for ourselves that perhaps this family um, is afraid. You already know that a lot of Marwadis from Charki Dadri are anyway migrating to Hyderabad already. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like a migratory route that's very, very popular. And maybe it's this one episode that we can also assign to this particular family. Again, since we're writing a historical novel, um, we had to take that leap of faith. So very often you will need to dip into historical uh, academic research that others have done on the community, the locality, the people, or, you know, something similar, and then build, um, you know, sort of, um, sort of imagine that uh, for the family that you're working for, or yeah. working with. Yes, that perspective, the historical perspective needs to always be considered, yeah. But I would, on behalf of Khaki, I would really like to thank you so, so much. It's been fascinating. And, you know, um, one wouldn't think that there'd be so much that goes into all this. And it's really been an eye opener for me, at least. And uh, there are lots of messages saying the same thing. So thanks again for joining us today. And thank you, everybody, for uh, coming on board as well. Thank you so much Bye. for making because uh, I myself didn't know I'd worked on so many family histories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it was really, it was really fascinating. Thank you so much once again. Thank you everyone for joining in.